The logistics up front, I guess. Oh, about me. Um, I'm mostly traditionally published. I have books with a couple of indie publishers. My six, I'm with Random House and Bain. I'm also a Bain editor. Okay. Uh, in terms of like the background of where this is all coming from, I edit my books and my co-writers' books, and I've edited for Wordfire Press and for Bain, and I have a career in law, and uh, that's kind of my background. So um, I'm going to pass around uh, little kind of sign-up sheets, which will give you up to three things. Your choice, okay? Uh, one. Uh, if you want to be on my mailing list, you can. Okay. Uh, two, I'm going to give away this stack of books at the end of this class, and I'm going to use an app to randomize numbers off the people who signed up for the sheet. Uh, three, if you give me your email address and you want the slide deck, I'll email you the slide deck. Now, if you don't want to be on my mailing list, fine. There's like a, put an X in the third column, you won't go on my mailing list. Okay, not everybody wants to be on my mailing list. That's fine. But I'm going to, I'm going to, you got enough people, I'm going to pass kind of two sheets down each side. And here, I'll send a pen along with you. How about that? Okay, awesome. If you don't want to be on my mailing list, check the column that says no mail. All right. What are, what am I going to talk about? Uh, so, self-editing for muscular prose. So, um, it might feel as we're talking, and I want to talk, I want to talk. I'm going to ask you questions and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Uh, and sometimes it will feel like uh, I am saying you should write shorter. That is not the goal. You will see that other times I will, I will suggest maybe writing more, okay, on a point. I, the, the goal here is more muscular prose. What do I mean by that? Well, look, uh, it's like the muscle on your body, right? That's the, the muscles are the part that does the lifting work, that brings the oomph and the power. The goal here is uh, not short writing, but writing where all of your words are effective, where you don't have wasted words that are just kind of fat, okay? So, or are inert or are too blank. Now, um, I don't want to give you an exhortation. Uh, I want to be as specific as possible. So I'm gonna give you like 10 rules. Hey, look for this and get rid of it. Look for this, change it. Look for this, do it differently. Okay, this is why you might want the slide deck, because I don't have a hand that you can look at the slide deck. Right? So, I want to be as specific as possible. Here's the thing I want to say up front, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Your point of view that your story adopts is essential. The point of view in which the story is written absolutely determines what every word in the story means. Okay? Uh, and it's going to make some words redundant, and it's going to change the meaning of some words, and we're going to see that as we go through. Okay? So, uh, you can't follow a better example than Moses, really, so I'm going to try and give you ten rules. Alright? Uh, so here we go. By the way, I haven't achieved, there's going to be like 15 or something by the end. But you know, it's basically ten. It's basically ten. Ten-ish. Ten-ish. It's like, yeah, oh, 10. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I gotta show my kids that. Um, all right, so I come from, like I'm a lawyer. I still am a lawyer, I know. Um, lawyers have this terrible habit in writing, okay? And so you're writing like an agreement that you say, you know, the you know, seller represents that he's not bound by any contract that affects the property. Oh, but what if it's not a contract? What if it's an option? Okay, no contract or option that affects the property. Oh, but wait, what if it is a, and you end up with long lists of synonyms, right? Because the lawyer's trying to, every possible, that's terrible legal writing. It's worse fiction writing. And yet we do it all the time, right? We do it all the time. Let me give you a couple of, a couple of postures in which you might see that. By the way, you will see that the yellow italicized lines that are indented are my sample sentences for us to discuss, okay? I have not drawn this from anybody's real submission for Bain or something. There's nobody to embarrass here, right? I made these all up. What's wrong with this first sentence? It certainly gets the point across. It's heavy-handed. It's very heavy-handed. It's very redundant, yeah. What? Now, by the way, 
Well, let's, get, let's take it in that order. So what's a better sentence? I agree with that. Big is very, very weak. So now, which of the other describers I, I choose might depend on exactly what I'm trying to emphasize, right? So maybe, maybe it's the muscles, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's the hulkingness, right? He said with a small fear in his voice. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think look as, as a first step, you just pick which of those two you think is more the point you want to make and, and delete the others. Okay. Now, I think we can do better than he was a hulking warrior. That's itself not a great sentence either, but it would be an improvement over this. Yeah? Now, by the way, is there a circumstance where you might want to keep the sentence like this? You might deliberately write it like this? If the person seeing the big, hulking, muscular word was really keen on how big, hulking, muscular it was. That's what this sentence really says is that the point of view character can't get over the fact how huge the person is, right? So you might wanna do that, but you should do it on purpose when you really wanna make the point that that is a, just one big guy, right? And a single word won't do it. All right, so here's, here's another uh, circumstance where adjectives are redundant. So like the rule here is just go through and look for redundant adjectives. Turns out there's a lot, okay? The first time you describe something, you need adjectives, right? It was red, it was big, it was oblong, right? But once you've established that, for example, okay, uh, that, that you know, your character meets, meets a Bedouin guy, and we hear a bunch about the Bedouin, and he is short, and he is, you know, uh, he is highly caffeinated, and, and uh, he has aquiline features and whatever. Once we hear all of that, and then your point of view character follows the Bedouin downhill, do we need to hear that the Bedouin is short again? Turns out we do. We do that all the time in our writing. We don't need to. We just need to know who is following the Bedouin is enough. Right? Now again, maybe you're obsessing about the shortness of the Bedouin, right? Um, what's another circumstance? What's the other circumstance where you where that Adjective is okay. Two Bedouins. There's more than one Bedouin. That's exactly right. There's the tall one, the short one, and the jolly one, right? You followed the short one down there. Might be a plot point later that he is specifically short, too short to do something. That is tr that's true. So here's a question. We're like jumping ahead to like point number nine or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I would say I would say this. Um, make sure you say that the Bedouin is short. And if you're going to show, if, if you if you want us, we want to make sure we don't miss it. Then maybe don't just say he's short. Maybe put in a little vignette, not even like a full scene. The better one couldn't reach the ship on the wagon, right? To make the point, and then trust your reader. Yeah. If you have to keep reminding him, you're you're not confident in what you've communicated, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So that's so that's one. Get rid of redundant action. Are way easier than Moses' commands. Um, okay. So uh, we all the time use words that actually have no objective meaning. Okay, this is not a complete list. This is just a list. Okay? Weird, beautiful, uncanny, okay, surprising. What do I mean when I say these words have no objective meaning? That's true, and if I say that something is weird, what do I really mean? Like in my, I'm, in my novel, it was a weird stone. Weird to me. Weird to me. I mean, well, yeah, weird to the point of view me. character. These words all describe the reaction of the point of view character and not actually the thing. Which makes them very weak sauce, right? It now, now maybe, again, maybe you really need to say that what the character's reaction is. There are better ways to do that. So I would frankly avoid adjectives like when, I, when I'm re-editing my own stuff and I come across anything where I go, oh, that's actually the point of view character's perception, um, I, I change it. Now, what are my options for changing it, by the way? 
Oh, very good. That's like the, that's like if I really care, if I really care about the weirdness of the stone or the beauty of the man, right? Then then I don't say oh, he was handsome. I I talk about I describe him, right? His chiseled features and his you know I don't know whatever his high clear forehead is. Sitting with sparkling eyes, right? Describe it, and now I and then and and describe it in a beautiful way, right? Uh, yeah, very good. Uh, another option, yes. Sure. Sure. If it's if it's sure if if it's very like. Um, uh, colloquial and the, and the characters tell your voice. Hey, what's the problem? You tell me. If I if I if I have that character say, oh man, it's so weird. Oh, that was weird. Oh, that's weird. What's the what's the risk? Yeah, or that it doesn't mean anything. That it's just like a verbal tag, oh, right? <laughs> that is true. So an editor who an editor reading your book when they notice will often at this point just highlight if the same word appears. Repeatedly, um, it's as English as we went around the world stealing everybody's vocabulary. So we have like more vocabulary than anybody, and so we show our our articulacy by by using synonyms for right? whatever reason. We're. So yeah, so another option is just to consider striking it. Is to say, do I really need to say the stone was weird? I don't. Know. Right? I don't. Know. Or describe how the stone is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Now again, then misshapen. You have to. You have to say like you know the, the on the on the bed of smooth stones. There was a singular. There was a single irregular trapezoid, right? Now like we're saying, well, why is it weird? Because it doesn't look like the rest of the rocks, right? Or they're all gray and there's one that's blue with a hole through it, right? Or it moves. So yeah. That's weird. That's weird. Okay, that's two. How about number three here? Um, modal verbs. So modal verbs are can, may, sh will, should. Okay. Um, any of them, but boy, especially the word could, get inserted into uh, sentences where they mean nothing. Okay. What does Jim could see that the door is, was open? What does that almost certainly mean? Jim saw that the door was open, right? Un unless, unless, right? Unless, until this moment, Jim had been blind, right? And what we want to tell you is he now has the ability to see, right? Because Rasputin spit in his eyes or whatever, right? So yeah, this adds nothing. Uh, it just makes your it just makes your uh, it just makes your sentence longer. Okay. Like a couple more examples of modal verbs. So honestly, if you want to, here's the here's the simple version of this commandment. Just look for the word could. Oh. Honestly, you can go through. That's the biggest offender. This is a little bit less obvious, but like depending exactly on the context, unless we really mean a sort of a counterfactual. Uh, or like an if-then, you know, protocy, apodicy kind of sentence. This probably just means Sally prefers the chicken, mm -hmm. right? It probably doesn't. Would probably doesn't add anything there. Right? Could, would, should. Yeah, could, would, should. Could is the biggest offender. Okay. All the time we do that. Yeah. Oh, you wait. We're gonna see this sentence shrink repeatedly. We're not done with this sentence. Yeah, that's that's correct. You are absolutely correct. Uh, because if we know it's Jim's point, we're getting ahead now. If it's Jim's point of view, we don't need Jim either, right? We don't need Jim in the sentence. Oh, go ahead. So, most of my examples basically assume you're in a, some kind of third person limited. I think that's the most common conventional style today. It's certainly not the only one, right? 
So you, you'll need to think this through a bit, but if you are writing in a third person, on, person omniscient, like who is the narrator, right? Because that narrator is still defining what these words mean. In this sentence, it's still saying, the narrator is still saying Jim could, you know, it still has an extra word, probably. Right. But, since we're not rooted in Jim's point of view, maybe you want to say Jim saw the rose over, right? So yes, that is, that is right. Um, and you're a couple of flights ahead. Okay, so, uh, which is fine, this is fine. I'm a professional, we can do this in any order. Um, here's a totally non-exhaustive list of a bunch of words that usually mean nothing. And we just say them because we're flying, I'm right to say that we write them because we're flying along writing and they come out. Okay? Uh, so that's fine. Don't slow yourself down to not make the words come out. Just delete them when you go back and read, right, when you edit. So, uh, do we need the that? No. We probably don't need the that, right? Jim saw the door was open. Again, we're, we're not done with that sentence. Uh, some kind of sword lay on the altar could be shorter, right? A sword, like, did we lose any information? I don't think we did, right? Unless there's some really particular content. A sword lay on the altar. Hey, uh, how about this one? Could it just be a dwarf? Yeah, I think it means exactly the same thing. Uh, here's a fun one. Uh, what does own tell us? Clark bit his knuckles. Yeah, Clark bit his knuckles is the best sentence here. That's right. So, first of all, the only time you really need that is if, is if Clark and Brad here are like hand wrestling and you want to make clear that Clark doesn't bite Brad's hand. Right? That's the only reason you need own. Um, and, well, I mean, it could happen, right? Probably more likely to want to specify that he did bite Brad's hand, right? That's the weirder thing. So, um, and we do this all the time. We stick the word own in. But, yeah, the better sentence, Clark bit the knuckles of his hand, and probably a better sentence, unless you have some rhetorical reason to want this order, is Clark bit his knuckles. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. She held it in her hand. She held it. What else did she hold it in? Yeah, that's great. Was it her teeth? Right. She probably just held it. That's awesome. That's like that's like Man of Seven or something. We're gonna get there. Uh, let's see. I think I saw a hand over here. The third one, the dwarf. Yeah. Unless we're talking about a dwarf. Right. Right. If there was some reason, this is a. This is a partitive genitive. We're saying there's a group of dwarfs and one of them came out. If there's some reason why that really matters, like if really the image that you want to communicate is over there is the knot of dwarfs and they emitted a soul dwarf and he walked over here to the image, right? Yes, yeah. But probably most of the time a dwarf, right? And by the way, all this stuff, right? There's, there's like a rule of reason. Like you gotta look at this sentence and think, what do I mean here? Do I mean something that requires, right? As you may. Yeah. Or just the shortest dwarf. Short, better than dwarf? It's all one story, actually. It's my, it's my working process. Um, yeah. Hey, does, does the train moving very fast tell us anything? It probably doesn't. Right? The, train even, was, the train was speeding. Right, and even the train uh, was moving fast pretty late. The train was speeding is better. I would suggest, and we're getting ahead into like rule seven or eight here, that actually I even, I would like to get rid of the word was and say that like the train rattled along or the train hummed at 80 miles an hour or something like that, right? That's another rule, yeah, awesome. Uh, yep. So, uh, okay, so, uh, point of view. So, we're, we're back to Jim here, right? Your point of view makes some words completely redundant. So, uh, what do I mean? Well, if we know that it's Jim's point of view, right? If we're in Jim's point of view, then in theory, every single word is, is coming to us through Jim. It's all Jim's perceptions, it's all Jim's thoughts. If you're stepping outside Jim to make a comment, 
you're, you're, you're not actually a third person point of view. You're doing something else, right? So, uh, so that affects the words we, we need to write. So again, here, if we, if we know it's Jim's point of view, right, we don't, we don't need to say that Jim saw the door was open. The door was open means Jim saw the door was open, right? We're in Jim's head falling in on a little camera. The door was open. How about this one? If we know we're like in Sarah's point of view, what does that let us do with that sentence? You can cut it in half. Because the question, where was he, can only mean Sarah is wondering that. Sarah is thinking, where is he? Right? That's exactly right. Yes? at like double speed. <laughs> I, the, the narrator should catch that to some degree. Now if you are worried about it, if you don't trust the narrator to get it right, then that maybe is a reason not to do this. I mean you could probably delete herself if you didn't want to go all the way. But then it sounds like the, it's going to sound like she said something out loud, right? Sure, you you could do that, and I think that would be a that would be a moderate improvement. And everything is context, right? Everything is context. Me, ninety nine percent of the time, I would just have it first three words, as long as I know who the point of view character is clearly. Yeah. But that's an interesting point about audio. Yeah. Can I respond to that? Oh yes. <laughs> uh, I have to say that in a, in a POV like that, everything is Sarah's voice. I mean, she's your POV character, so it's automatically in Sarah's voice. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so I have like some words that she just thought. So if she sound like intrusively having a conversation with herself, right. you can put it in italics. But how does the audience look? How, so that's where I get mixed up. Like, and the audience look. How does the narrative deal with that? If it's not actually Again, if it's in Sarah's POV, everything the narrator is saying is by default Sarah's internal voice. The, li the listener is just like the reader. They know that it's in Sarah's POV. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's interesting advice. Let's say that louder, though, so everyone hears it. I think what she's saying is there's intrusive thoughts in her own voice that aren't her. Sure. And she was distinguished with thoughts of Sarah and the intrusive thoughts. So she's going to have to speak to her narrator and explain the situation. If you're, if you're worried that the narrator's not going to get it and therefore the reader's not going to get it, I think that's reasonable as to say to the narrator, hey, look, FYI, this is what I'm thinking here. And if you don't have a direct contact with the narrator, whoever your audio book publisher is, we'll give you a contact with them. Hopefully. <laughs> well, one way might be to set it up, with, even though it's words, and you're kind of wanting to shorten words, but what about using something like, she looked, then where was he, and it's an action, that, oh, yeah. uh, that creates the, the impetus for. I like that. In the same way that you would replace a dialogue tag with a statement of action, uh, an action by or by the speaker. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. And he can't do it all the time because then it's ridiculous. Like, she looked, where was he? She stepped sideways. He wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> she checked her pocket, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> He's nowhere. Yeah. Uh, excellent questions. I uh, appreciate the input. That's that's helpful. Um, look, we're halfway through the decalogue. It's easy. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, the verb to be is weak. Um, it's weak. Uh, it, it, it's easy to overuse. Often it just functions as a as a copula as a connector. He was tall. Really, he tall is the idea, right? Plenty of languages do without the was, actually. Not languages that have been to the moon. Yet. <laughs> Yet. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, German and Dutch are really good about this, actually. Um, like, an object like a book isn't on the table. It, it does the verb lies on the table, or it stands on the table. 
Um, well, let's look. Let's look at the example. So, the bus stop. How can we like assume that's you know as short as we were not trying to get any shorter? But how can we replace was in an interesting way here? Wait. Oh, waited is awesome because waited sounds like the bus stop is sentient and there is destiny. Right? The bus stop is waiting for the heroine to arrive. Right? Now suddenly it, it's more muscular. It's not just a neutral statement that there's a thing there, like it's adding, it's adding character to it. Um, or how about lurked? I like that one. How about the bus stop lurked at the edge of town? Right? What kind of neighborhood does a bus stop lurk in? A warm place. Yeah, maybe yeah. the smell is off and there's a lot more graffiti than you're used to, and right? Uh, you're a little nervous. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the subjective compliment, right? He, he was tall. The door was open. We're back to Jim. Uh, we got rid of Jim. Now we're in Jim's POV and the door is open. Um, how do we improve on this? He was taller than me. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty short. <laughs> yeah, he towered over me is the cliche. But frankly, it's not any worse than this, right? It's a little cliche, but like, uh, it's more colorful. What else could you do? He said, uh, "Taller than me." I can see up his nostrils. Thank you. I can see up his nostrils. Uh, how would you do that? Oh, I looked up at him. Yeah, there you go. I looked up at him. Yeah, fantastic. He hulked over me. He hulked over me. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was big, hulking, and muscular. So, well, this is a great novel. You're going to love it. You're going to love this. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot right now. Now, what, as I'm like flipping through and just editing, you know, what am I looking for? I'm looking for, for the word was and were, and because that's. You don't want to delete. If you write a book that doesn't have the, the verb to be in it, that's a gimmick, right? Don't do that. But like you know, you can replace a lot of them with something that's more colorful and more powerful, and your prose will, will will feel better for it. Um, how about this? The door was open. It's hard to get shorter than that, but it's a little bland, right? Ooh, slow open. It's moving. Life See now that's longer, but it's got it's a better image. Right, light spilled through the open door, or like a breeze, or a smell, or you, you know, beyond, beyond lay wooded field, beyond the door lay wooded field. Well, now I know the door is open, and I know Jim's looking through, right, and I know what's catching his eye, right. Um, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so uh, I'm not done with six. I told you I was going to cheat, Jim. So, and I think Rob was making this point. Pro uh, progressive verbs. Um, or the imperfect, was looking, right? We, we do this, now by the way, there might be a reason to write this sentence. What's the reason to write this sentence? The action, is, the next action happens in the middle of yeah. that. that uh, there's, there's some reason to emphasize that this is ongoing, and classically, it's happening and something interrupts it, he right? Was pulling out a, I was pulling out a sword when he hit me. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's like obsessive and continues and you can't pull out of it. That might be another reason to, to write it this way. But what I, what I think we often do very, well, I don't think we do this. I read the manuscripts, okay? <laughs> Especially in like the opening part of a scene, right? So, you know, uh, Bob walks into the kitchen. What does Bob see? Jim was looking out the open door. Sally was standing in the corner. Herb was making a sandwich. It makes it feel bloated. They're all like stuck in some kind of process. Is there a reason we can't say Jim looked out the door? So, you know, Irv made a sandwich at the counter. I think, I think there's no, usually there's no reason we can't. Absolutely, absolutely. I was trying to do that too, right? I found out that I wanted to get rid of the lessons. I can't stand it to Jim looked out the door. Yeah. And again, there will be some times when you want to do this, when you want to emphasize that there's an ongoing nature to this. This is a continuous action. It's, it's imperfect, right? Meaning it's, it's not over. I'm emphasizing that. Um, but we overuse this. We overuse this. All right. Uh, seven adverbs. Uh, okay. Uh, again, if I'm just going to the manuscript, right? 
I'm trying to give you rules that are actionable where you can be like, look for this, look for that. Look for adverbs. Look for adverbs. So, hey, that verb's pretty colorful, right? So the witch cackles. Uh, is, is gleefully really adding much most of the time? It's probably not, yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. So maybe this has to do with the expectations of the reader. You want to make sure, like, so, uh, you know, if you want to make clear that the witch does not seem like she's mean or evil, right? Yeah. She had a gentle smile and a name badge that said, hi, my name is Meg. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, this is a bit of a weird. But you can set it up so that um, that you can drive away from the study. So when they do the castle, don't have to add these ladies. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I think probably most of the time that's enough. It's, yeah, and I, and I see again a lot. People, especially, you know, especially like this, where you have a dialogue tag, people are worried they're saying said too much, so they replace said with something else, and then they also have an adverb. Like, uh, hello, Jim roared loudly. Like, that's just too much, right? Uh, speaking of which, right? So, uh, by the way, most of the time when you get rid of an adverb, you can, you can keep the same meaning by, by changing your verb. Right, to something that's more colorful that carries it, at least some of the meaning the adverb did. Right, snapped, exclaimed, maybe blurted. Right, and those all have slight nuances between them. Right, uh, snap might have like a little bit of an aggressive edge. Blurted sounds like he's lost control of himself or something. Right, a great vocabulary. Uh, yes. Something I noticed only audio. Okay. The general, the general advice is only you said, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That works great. You do read it, but it disappears when you pull a right? It disappears, that's right. It doesn't disappear in audio books. Okay. So if you're listening to your audio book and you have a long dialogue and you get like 19 cents in a row, you know, you want to think about that. If you know your book is going to do a lot of audio books, you want to yeah. think about that. That's interesting. A that perfect example group? of oh. that is Raymond Chamber. Raymond Chamber novel on audiobook. He says said, said a lot. Said. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect example, and I've done this better. So you try and mix it up. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm just saying, be aware yeah. of that when you're writing specifically for audiobooks. Yeah. You, you, you know, it does not appear on audiobooks. You That's interesting. I, I appreciate that input. That's all. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know what to call this. I've made up this phrase. But I see this all the time. She turned and looked out the window, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think what's going on here is the writer, and the writer is sometimes me, okay? You like know where everything is in your head, and you go, oh, to look out the window, she's gonna have to turn. So you're going at like a thousand words an hour. Do, 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 does she turn and look out the window, right? Do we probably need to know that she turns? We probably don't. So uh, we do this all the time. Uh, you bend over and pick up the sword. Are there circumstances where it matters that he bent over? <coughs> sure, someone like pinches him, right? Then, then, then it's help. Then that's the actually the action we care about, not that he picked up the sword. Um, yeah. So verbs that set up the real action, right? You went to somewhere and did something. You uh, you turned. You looked at something. You did something. Um, again, you just go through. You can, they're easy to find. They're easy to just get rid of. Well, he bent. Well, that's the So, what's the nuance of difference there? Yeah. It doesn't actually, in that sentence, complete the action. Maybe he did pick up the sword. Maybe he didn't. Right? If he bent to pick up the sword, what you're really saying is he bent in order to get the sword. Right? So, so slightly different. And sure, there's, there's, there's. You can imagine context where you'd want to do that, right? If the if the action's interrupted at that moment, um, or it's not a sword, but it's a viper. So I hate it. I, <laughs> again, not, not again. 
So, uh, okay, all right. Nine, okay, this is long. Ooh. I was saying this, or I know, and I had to write this. So, <laughs> uh, um, I, was, I was saying this earlier. I'm not sure this is even the best example of this. But what I see all the time, I do this too, is we show the reader something, but we don't really believe that she's going to get it. So then we also tell her. And sometimes we show, and then we tell, and then we tell again to really make sure that the point gets across. And at a certain point, you have to trust the reader, that the reader will get it, okay? So, uh, so like this, in this first one, right? Do I need the second sentence? Probably. It's very also hyperventilating. So if this person, this person is panicking, <laughs> right? But I probably don't need the second sentence because the reader's gonna infer from what I wrote. Oh. There's a series of three to three toed footprints means it's not my friend Bob. <laughs> right? And if it is, Bob's got problems. Yeah, he's taking the diet for So, uh, so okay, so without like reading this out loud, um, you know, we get this discussion, and here's, here's me taking a stab late at night, it's sort of like, okay, what does beauty look like? Right, rather than saying she was beautiful, right? So this may be a sentence that says, she was beautiful. What does the second sentence say? She's beautiful. It says also, she was beautiful. What does the third sentence say? <laughs> She's beautiful and I'm kind of feeling it. Um, <laughs> and then the fourth sentence says, I'm really feeling it. And then we have two more sentences. <laughs> yeah. It was late. Uh, I was on the road. So, so. Now look, where you want to stop in here may depend on the genre, right? <laughs> I mean, some genres maybe you want to go a little further, but can we all agree that probably the last two sentences at least are pointless? Right. And maybe, depending on what you're writing, maybe you leave the first one. Or maybe you keep the second one only or something. Maybe this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so especially in fantasy. So what you're saying is the character knows something in her head that the reader won't know because the character lives in the fantasy world. And therefore, I put in this second sentence to, uh, to, to clarify for the reader, why is this relevant? Well, because, you know, it's clearly a reptilian tree sloth, right, or whatever. <laughs> So I like that, and, and I think maybe one thing to say is you gotta make sure you really show the reader, right? Like, make sure that, it, and then you can trust the reader. If you haven't actually showed them, or you're not confident you have shown them, that's when you're gonna overuse, what you call them? Simple declaratory, explanatory sentences? Declaratory statements. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're, it's only 10, so we're like right at the end. I can give away three books. Um, this is the rule of thumb, right? Delete anything else that adds nothing. This is actually the, I picked up the sword with my hand is a great example of this. <laughs> right, I picked up the sword with my hand is not on there, but it's a great example. But, but here's like another one. Uh, so I sat down at the table. Now, first of all, uh, do you probably need down? You probably almost never need it down, right? But also, if you come in and you describe, if your character, Jim, well, Jim again, comes into the room and he sees a table and a bunch of chairs, and that's all he sees, do you need at the table either? You probably don't need at the table either. You can just say, I sat, or, you know, Jim sat in that case, right? Um, 
So, uh, yeah, S stood up, sat down, fell down, laid down. Anything you do with your with one of your members, uh, that didn't sound good. With a, <laughs> with a hand or a foot, is what I meant. Like, you know, kicked it with his foot, this stupid. Kicked it, we just kicked it, right? Uh, here we get into kind of the dialogue tax point. So what do you mean if you stood, sat, and fell, and laid, et cetera, not get rid of the stood, the laid, et cetera? Yeah, what I, what I mean is that's right. Most of the time, that uh, that little adverb doesn't actually add any meaning. We just we just say it because that's that's how we that's how we say it. Yeah. Um, now, if you need to distinguish someone who is standing still or standing in the corner as opposed to standing up, right? Then there are moments where you where you want to use that. Um, all right, dialogue tags. I okay. I think we can do with a lot fewer dialogue tags than most of us. Now, some of you audio guys may be like way on its own. Um, said is okay. Said mostly disappears, right? I like using I like using uh, action points as opposed to a dialogue tag. I mean, what can we do with this one, for example? Yeah, Jim pointed. No, Jim pointed is going to be. Yeah, with, with a period after no, right? Uh, yeah, Jim, and of course it's clearly gotta be, uh, it's gotta be Jim talking. Um, there are other ways you can get rid of dialogue uh, tags. If you have only two speakers, you know, they're gonna alternate when they speak, unless you say otherwise. Now that doesn't mean you should go pages and pages because we'll get lost. Uh, but you can, you can go a beat or two with no dialogue tag, right? Um, dialect, this is like a whole other thing to talk about for a whole other 45 minutes, so we're not going to. But uh, if, if one of your characters has, a, even if it's as simple as one of your characters says ain't, and the other character doesn't, there's a sentence with ain't in it, we know who said it. You don't need to go, comma, Carruthers said. Right? Carruthers is the one that says ain't. Um, so, uh, yeah, and this is the, here's just another, without any examples, anything your reader already knows, if you're repeating it later in the novel, what it means is your point of view character is thinking about it again and obsessing about it. Now, if, if, you, if that's what's happening, your point of view character is thinking, oh, the candle was on the table, why was that? Fine, right? Otherwise, don't, just don't repeat, just don't repeat. All right, I think that's my 10. So let's, how about I give away six free books here, and then if you, do we have time for Q&A? What time is it? Oh, yeah, four minutes. Yeah, Bam. Time. Okay, let's do this. Where are the sheets? I'm gonna, I'm gonna randomize some numbers. Real quick. If you only wrote your email address, I'm gonna be reading your email address out here in a second. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the pen. I guess you can come up and like the first the first winner can just pick the book they want. How about that? I don't know any other way to do this. Uh, other than combat. Um, that's an idea. No, no, no fighting. That's not okay. Um, <laughs> I bent down and picked up the better with war and threw it. Bam! And it was Gets actually a viper. Again! Okay. So, Ashley Carter, come on up and get a free book. Woo! Come on up. That, is, that is fantastic, and I'll sign it if you want, but no obligation, take your pick. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Lanny or Lonnie Brothers? Uh -huh. All right, awesome. Come on up and grab a book. Uh, okay, so Corey Gilliam? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Willow Shipperly. What a glorious name. Willow Shipperly, that's awesome. All right, two more, right? Yeah, two more. Okay, so. Uh, Mandy Oman, or Oman, maybe? Awesome. And we'll get one off of here. And uh, I think that maybe says Sullen Show. Okay, awesome. Uh, 
I will sign it if you want. Um, we got like a minute. Is there any like last question or objection? Dave, you're wrong. Yes, give me up. Okay, so people always give this advice like right the way you speak. Yeah. You know? And it's like in my mind that's fine for like getting it out of your brain and out of the page. Yeah. But you don't stop there. Would you have like a good overall advice or rule for that? So there are different literary registers. I think you should write the book you want to read. Yeah, that's what I think you should do. Okay. Thank you. you have to read the kind of books that you want to read and notice them. That is true. I, 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 I often find myself reading books and then stop and be like, wait a minute. Stand on the side. How did she actually this in this that in this sentence part. and go back and read it as a writer and be like, oh, that's mm -hmm. what she did. I never noticed that because I was just going to the story, which yeah. is really the reason. Yeah. But going back and reading <laughs> the papers as a writer instead of just reading the story as a writer. One last question. Anybody? Okay, off. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I just was a tricorn. I feel like with the midterm elections, it's a very tricorn kind of moment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you, everybody. Have a great conference.